controlling us. And this is a way that you can have uh, an ambivalence, an appropriate ambivalence toward money, meaning where you can build wealth, you can do well for yourself, but um, where money is not the controlling factor of your life. So let's talk about it. Uh, step one, $1,000 emergency fund. Now there's a little bit like you can look up, there's like an adjusted version of this for like teenagers. I think that the suggestion was like a $500 emergency fund um, building in categories of um, three categories of give, giving like to charity or to others, give, save, spend, and just building that practice. But this is kind of the full program, all right? Um, $1,000 emergency fund, all right, is step one. Now, this is money that is saved legitimately, but as quickly as possible. So they want to sell some stuff, um, say garage sale, but now it's like Facebook Marketplace, or, you know, online, let go app or, you know, something like that, or, that are kind of like the impromptu garage sale, you know, with people online. And so this is the step when people sometimes ask me or they want to talk about financial things. And sometimes people just want to talk a little bit. Um, they're not necessarily someone who is going to be a, a client. They're like, well, you know, can we have this discussion about this? Can we talk about can we sit down? Can we do this or that? And I say to them to know whether or not somebody's fully serious. I say, okay, well, well step one is thousand dollar emergency fund. Once you've got that, let me know. And then we'll continue to talk further because that's the way I know whether or not someone's really serious or not is if someone's willing to give up some stuff, whether they're willing to maybe cancel some things like cable or, going out to eat or spending on, you know, shopping online or just any shopping or, you know, doing these other things and, or they're willing to, you know, have a garage sale, work some extra hours, put together a thousand dollars as quickly as possible as an emergency fund. Once I've seen that people give a little bit more um, sacrifice then that's I have a little bit more confidence that people are ready to, to start on this type of thing. So $1,000 emergency fund. Now, the goal of this is to protect you. The goal of this is to protect you. Most Americans, 78% of Americans live paycheck to paycheck. 63% of Americans do not have even $500 in savings to cover an emergency of that amount. So what this means is most Americans are going through normal life, living on their paycheck, spending their, their full paycheck. And that's not a judgmental statement. That's just how it is. That's what living paycheck to paycheck means. And then they're waiting for their next paycheck. But life happens while that's all going on. And so what if there's a $500 emergency? What if the car breaks? What if the dog breaks? What if the house breaks? What if there's a medical expense, right? Boom, $700, $500, like these things uh, occur. It's a good question. Yeah, where you have the money is uh, is either way is acceptable, but you kind of have to know yourself. So, for example, I have my emergency fund was in the bank, um, but it's also okay to have it in. Some people have it in a cookie jar in their house, you know, or you know, keep it somewhere that's safe. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, safe, like if somebody breaks in the yeah, other or somebody's going to steal it or, you know, but, but that doesn't, 
normally happen. The it also needs to be safe uh, from you, you know, safe from ourselves. And so, like, if I had a thousand dollars in, you know, shoebox in my closet, I I'm not gonna um, likely take that out and just go spend it. I have another, you know, so my mine was always in the bank just because that's the way I like to do it. And it would take a little bit more work to to get to it. Um, so some people, it's a better idea for them to do that. Some people, they they want to have it right there in cash just in case they um, they need to pay for something. So, um, yeah, an emergency is um, an unexpected financial circumstance. Un um, unexpected, it doesn't have to be like somebody's dying. It can be that something happens with the car or just it's an un, it, it doesn't matter really what it is. Um, it's an unexpected financial circumstance. Now, some things can cost more than a thousand dollars. I get that. But um, really, it's just anything that comes up that's going to cost you money that you didn't and couldn't really plan for. And if it continues to happen, though, you put that in it and it continues to happen predictably and consistently, it's not an emergency anymore. It become, it may be serious, but it becomes part of your budget. So for example, if somebody has some sort of medical thing that um, is going to cost a certain amount of money every month, that may be serious, but it's not an emergency. That's something that you, you budget for. Um, and so there are times occasionally where it's like, you don't worry about debt. You don't, you know, you, you just have to deal with things like you just pile up cash to continue to um, deal with the situation. Um, and I get that. That's a, that's a more serious situation a lot of times than a thousand dollar emergency um, or than paying off debt. Um, so sometimes you you take that situation to, to deal with that. But, um, you know, like if your car, something breaks on the car and it breaks consistently you know, you may start setting aside, okay, well, once a month or, you know, every month or two, there's some sort of problem with my car. Maybe I start setting aside money to, uh, to pay that if I don't, you know, if I don't want to uh, get a new car, can't get a new car yet, or start saving up for a, you know, a different used car or something. Um, so that's, that's kind of how you, uh, how you evaluate what an emergency is. So an emergency is an unexpected financial circumstance that is not in your budget that you, you did not plan for because you couldn't plan for it. Right. We don't know when like a water pipe is going to break in our house. Um, but we do know every month that we have like an electric bill or groceries or, gasoline for the car or, you know, uh, or, you know, and you may not be in this situation, but it depends. It's like, okay. Or like monthly giving to church or something like that. Those are all things that you can budget for. What, what you can't budget for, um, necessarily are emergencies, but how you budget for an emergency is, is you have an emergency fund and that will protect you. And it is really odd um, and it doesn't protect you from everything, but that's why I use the word here, buffer, that um, it, it's a buffer zone. It's, 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 a, it's a layer of protection that you didn't have before. Doesn't mean it protects you from everything. Well, circling back to what I was saying, it is kind of odd that people find that once they have this emergency fund, they don't tend to experience as many unexpected financial emergencies. But when they do, a lot of times people emotionally still respond to the emergency like it's a crisis. But then they can, they realize, wait a second. Yes, $700 is always going to suck. I had a car, actually, I still have it uh, sold it to my parents and they use it when they're in town and stuff. Um, and, and it's okay. Um, but it was having problems with it that were like month to month or every couple months, like boom, $700, boom, $500. And I could handle that because it was a, you know, paid off used car. 
that I didn't have a car payment. So that was kind of the version of my car payment. But eventually I just got sick and tired of it. And and I, in cash, bought my current car, which is, you know, it was a new used car. It was a 2015 Camry. I bought it a few years old. Um, but I could only do that because of years and time of uh, going through this type of program. But um, what a lot of people notice is that so $700 is always going to suck. And we're always going to respond to that in a way of, of not liking it. And, and emergencies throw your life off. However, now we take the financial difficulty out of it of where am I going to get 500 bucks? We take the adding debt difficulty out of it. And we have now downgraded an, a, a crisis down to an inconvenience. But... You know, and then if you uh, you spend seven hundred dollars and you have three hundred left, you build up your emergency fund again and you keep on going. Okay, so uh, it's money saved for an unexpected financial circumstance. The pizza guy is not an unexpected financial circumstance. Um, so you have to make a commitment, and this is why you kind of have to know yourself as well. Of uh, do not use the emergency fund for non-emergencies. So do you really want to have a thousand dollars in your house where some people, it may be tempting for them to say, okay, well, wait a second. I need a little extra cash for this or that. And you know, you know, $20 here or there, it, which again, it's, it's your money, but if it's a truly an emergency fund, you're not supposed to touch it for those things. So if it's in the bank, sometimes people feel like, all right, it's a little bit separate from me. But, you know, some people could do the same thing with money in the bank, start moving that around and say, you know what, I'm out at dinner. I'm a little low on funds. Let me move, you know, a little bit from one account to another and uh, make sure dinner's covered here, you know, so you don't touch it for non-emergencies. Um, it's this is a practical thing, a money thing. But it's also an emotional, psychological thing to have that money there. It starts to give you, um, it starts to give you options. It starts to give you stability and freedom. And now this is where it gets, <clears throat> I think, a little more difficult for people is how this program works. Is that you do step one, and if you have debt of any kind, you, you don't hold on to savings um, more than that $1,000. Now, that's where people uh, struggle. They're fine with a $1,000 emergency fund. Um, but sometimes people like to, it's actually very common. I was talking with my sister about this yesterday. It's very common for people to have debt and like to have savings beyond that thousand dollars. But the debt is actually robbing you of your savings. It, you'd be better off just taking your your savings and attacking or totally paying off the debt in one go of it and say, yeah, you lose a bunch of money in your savings, but you also lose the debt and the payments therein that you owe. And once you don't owe anything, even if you're zeroed out, you, then you can actually start building positively. You know, the money that you save now actually stays with you. But if you save and you have debt, you're always in a situation where the debt is taken away from your savings. So it's it's not a way, it's a way that people feel more secure, but you have to kind of take, uh, you kind of the reason why you do this thousand dollar emergency fund is it's enough to protect you. It's enough to have the buffer but it also is enough for people to get serious about getting rid of their debt as quickly as possible um, because then you can continue to grow your, your emergency fund. So it, it has to do a serve a psychological and, and emotional purpose on two fronts. It has to give you some stability to know that you've protected yourself in the face of most emergencies. But it also has to give you enough pressure that you just don't leave it at that and you 
move on to the next step to, to attack the debt, which is step two, eliminate all debt. Okay, the word all is comprehensive except for, there is one exception, which is house debt, which is a different matter, okay? Uh, so I don't know who said this originally, but this is a statement that <laughs> gets said with debt sometimes. It says, if your outgo, money you're paying, if your outgo exceeds your income, your upkeep will be your downfall every time. Meaning if you spend more than you make, then your lifestyle, your upkeep will be your downfall every time. And this is, you know, I should charge you guys for this information that I'm about to give you in one sentence. Ready? Okay. Do not spend more than you make. Do not spend more than you make. That's, you know, that's my financial advice to you. That now it's like, okay, well, yeah, my order, I already knew that. Well, yeah, I know most people know that cognitively. But what they don't know, uh, they don't do it practically. They spend more than they make. That's why debt exists. And I know a lot of people feel like they have to and all that type of stuff. But the reason they feel like they have to, I'll argue, is that um, they're making that choice because, and they feel the pressure to do so for many reasons. Um, but I would guess at least in 98% of the time that it's because they're not sitting down and doing a monthly budget and planning every single dollar where it's going to go and seeing where they can make adjustments, cuts, ads, you know, whatever. Right. So, you know, if, if there's a $150 cable bill, right. There, there are things, right. That people choose to spend money on and I don't judge the choices. However, I, I, the choices become that people are making become a lot more evident if they sit down and know what their choices actually are with a monthly budget. So don't spend more than you make. List all debts in order. Okay. List all debts in order. This is called the debt snowball. You take all your debts, you put in one ugly pile on the table. Okay, there's not physically, right? And then you pay off the smallest debts first and move to the largest, creating momentum. Now, a lot of people say, well, no, you pay off the one with the highest interest rate. No, you pay off the biggest one first. You want to take down the big whale first and then, you know, the less. And look, you people can do it either way. If they're paying off debt, they're paying off debt. I've seen good financial programs suggest doing it the other way. Why I think this is the way to do it is because this is not a math problem. He, the, this is fourth grade math. It's not something that people don't understand the logistics behind. The problem is more people feeling like they can't do it or don't want to, you know, different things like that. So why this program recommends starting off with the smallest and working your way to the largest is this creates small short-term wins that allow you to continue going, okay? Now what you do is you start, a, you have a monthly budget where you're telling every dollar where to go and then you're making sacrifices and taking that money and attacking the smallest debt with it. Now, whenever you finish paying off that smallest debt, you take that same amount of money and now you have one less payment and you roll it over and attack the next debt. Okay. Once that money's gone, that those payments are gone. You take the money from that and it's a little bit more each time and you attack the next one and you keep going and you keep going and you refuse to add new debt. And you eventually take out the last one. And if you're diligent, most people who do this with, urgency and intensity find that they pay their debt off totally um, in about 18 months to two years. 18 months is about average. 
And I talked to a guy who, you know, a friend of mine, uh, met online, had some, you know, things in common. We were on a common political page and we started talking and uh, uh, we were talking about, you know, was bringing up debt and we were discussing some of those things. So I, you know, messaged him, we were talking about it. And he was saying, he's like, yeah, I got, you know, I'm in terrible student loan debt. I got my, you know, I've got, I owe this much. I took out loans as a kid and didn't know what I was doing. And uh, I'm like, wow, you know, that's terrible. And we're talking through it. And I said, well, have you heard of this stuff? And I'm like trying to talk to him a little bit about it. And he's like, oh, that's kind of interesting. I was like, well, dude, let me put it to you this way. I, I was like, I, he goes, well, I really want to get, move out for my parents. I really want to get married. I really, and this guy was, was older than me, you know, no judgment. I'm just saying. And, um, I'm like, couldn't, I'm like, okay, so you'd be making this amount per year, per month. Couldn't you with $24,000 of student loan debt, you know, if you really got intense and sacrificed for about two years, could you just do a thousand a month? Yeah. I mean, I, I'm like, I don't know what your budget is, but just think about it. If you did a thousand a month on the debt, giving up in all these other areas, maybe living at home, whatever you have to do, the, the, that would mean you'd be done in two years, right? Maybe work some extra hours, cut down on expenses, live it. No, I'm not going to do that. You know, I, I can't do that. I wouldn't be able to give up a thousand a month. Okay. Well, I don't know, maybe 500 a month. You know, you, you start thinking w creatively about, you know, alternatives. Now that guy is uh, no judgment against him. He's a great guy. He just said, you know, he eventually said, yeah, I don't, you know, I don't really want to talk about this anymore. I said, okay, you know, you can't convince people and I don't, uh, I don't intend to. But now it's, I think it's about two years after we've had that conversation. And as far as I know, he's still $24,000 in debt. I'm like, and still, you know, in his same situation that he was unhappy with before. So I was like, but if you had just started back then, you'd be done by now and, and wouldn't have this problem. Right. So it, again, it, it's, it's just thinking through the, the possibilities you know, of what would it take if you had debt? Um, what would it take to do it in two years? Just look at it. That's 24 months. How much per month would it take to do it in two years? Now, that may look like a crazy number, and it may be a crazy number, but you just think about it. I was talking to somebody, a friend who did um, kind of medical school, but did physician's assistant work, and talking about the debt. And I'm like, okay, let's look at, you know, instead of five to 10 years, maybe you think about what would two years look like, you know? Okay, maybe it's, maybe you do three, but you won't regret getting debt out of your life. I've never, I've never met or heard of a person who paid off their debt and said, you know what? That wasn't a good decision. I feel worse for having done that. I don't know. Anybody, I've never heard of anybody who has regretted paying off debt and staying out of debt and not getting into new debt. I, I have never, I don't think it exists. Maybe it does. You know, maybe I should do, you know, I don't have, <laughs> maybe I should get on some, you know, radio program and try to hear some, uh, some stories of people who, uh, who don't, who got out of debt and regretted it. But I think that this is, I think it's very possible, but I think it's takes a, a discipline and a mind change and a set of decisions that um, are very difficult. And I don't, oh, sorry.